if they need to generate millions of, of emails to someone, they can do it quite easily. And so they do that almost entirely through online petitions. We invited all animal advocates from around the world to explore important and complex topics. Through respectful solution-based dialogue, we attempt to find common ground. Welcome to another episode of Common Ground. I'm super excited to share this episode with you. It's one of our most robust conversations yet, and it actually went a bit long, so it's going to be split into three parts. So be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and hit that subscribe button so you can see the other episodes. With that, let's start the show. As animal advocates, we want to advance the plight of our fellow animals as fast as possible. But what about the overall strategy, and how do our tactics fit into this? What campaign should we be dedicating our limited time to? What's your favorite form of activism to do? So it does look like street outreach is a very common form of activism here today. The thing I like about it is it's an opportunity to really kind of hone my message. Um, and I, I quite like having conversations with people about this stuff because I think once we move past that, they say this, we say that type mentality and really go into it wanting to learn from the other person, it becomes a bit like a game of chess. And, and, and to me, that, that can be a lot of fun. The winner of this poll is the bottom one, disruptive style events. I really think it's quite interesting in terms of petitions get 0%. Because from a social, uh, sociological point of view, the state are really keen on things like petitions because they're, they're no good. <laughs> they don't do any good, you know. And so, you know, the state o often say, well, you know, if, if there's a problem, send us a, send us a petition, you know, or write a letter to your MP or TD, you know, whatever, Congress person, you know. Um, and it's interesting because, like, the favorite method for the state is usually the least effective. And then the most effective, arguably, are usually the ones that the state criminalize and don't like. So, you know, from, from that kind of um, sociological point of view, it's quite interesting. It's just for something to do, people to sign petitions. And like Roger says, they're just throwing mm -hmm. in, in their hand it in, you know, that kind of way. So petitions are, I think, they're a complete waste of time. Or I think... Sanctuaries are actually where my heart lies. Um, yeah. And I think there's so many ways we can tap into this, but I go to friend animal sanctuary um, yeah. quite regularly. And it's good for my self care, getting out in nature yeah. and spending time with the other animals there. Um, mm -hmm. However, I also, you know, in a respectful way, um, as respectful as possible, do get video footage of the animals there and tell their story on social media. And yeah. I think really highlighting that the uh, unique individual personalities of each of the residents there is a really powerful way to build, uh, frame the case for animal rights. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but when people come to the back into the sanctuary here, like they're amazed at all the different animals, you know, and all the personalities. And I, I see Sarah there was here too, and Roger, and I don't know many other, I can't, you know, the score, I see everyone else, but I didn't yet, but uh, everyone is amazed when they see all the different animals, you know, and all the different species. Like it's, it's wonderful, like you say, Jeremy, that, that, that they get such such joy of seeing the animals, you know. And, and it, uh, like when, when they're talking to people on the street, it's great. You know, I can say like at the sanctuary and, and the, you know, the, the other people with me say, Roger would say it and say it, say it and it, Jason, anyone that'd be with us would say it like with the sanctuary. So it's a great addition to tell people as well, to encourage them to go vegan, that they can come and relax at a sanctuary, you know, and uh, chill out and be with the animals, you know, and we can sit down and watch them wander around and stuff like that. But it's, it's brilliant because it connects what you're talking about to, to um, you know, individuals and, and, and the different animals. So it's, it's wonderful, Jeremy is right. Yeah, yeah, fair play. If I could just add my two cents on petitions. I think there's almost a kind of paradox with, petition, with petitions. Um, so myself, I don't sign them I don't really feel kind of motivated to sign them because I'm not really convinced that they have an effect even though it would only take me 30 seconds to do so and I think that my opinion there is shared by a lot of people perhaps millions around the world so if we did in fact change that perception and said okay I will do it, I will take that 30 seconds to sign it and these petitions get millions and millions more signatures then maybe they would have some impact yeah, but it kind of lets people off the hook if they sign something, they, they, they feel as if they've done something, you know, which, in reality they've done nothing, you know, we, we'd get meat eaters and they coming up to sign the petitions, you know. So I think petitions, 
I think petitions are an interesting tool that we can use. It's an interesting tactic. And I think, I think it's effective if we use them correctly. Um, you know, I, in the Shack campaign, for instance, we, petitions were the main way we did fundraising. I mean, in the U.S. anyways, that's how we made most of our money was getting people to sign petitions and convincing them that they should include a donation. Um, they weren't real petitions, but they helped us get donations. Um, I also think, you know, we use petitions um, as list growth opportunities. Um, again, maybe not necessarily for the, the, the purpose that a petition is originally intended, but you can really grow lists that way, uh, lists of supporters. And I think, you know, if you have enough people signing petitions, particularly in an online space, you know, larger NGOs, for instance, use petitions as a way to send emails to people. Um, in terms of like, you know, you get 10,000, 100,000 people to sign your online petition and every time someone signs it, an email gets blasted off to the CEO of that company. Um, and all of a sudden they have 10,000, 50,000 emails in their inbox. So I think that also can be beneficial. And I think also we can use petitions um, to um, get media. You know, we see um, petition deliveries as a great way to get media to bring attention to the issues, delivering petitions to um, you know, a, a place of decision or a point of decision that we want to interrupt. So I think, I think petitions generally like, yeah, they can be irritating and probably don't do a whole lot, but I think if we use them in big ways, then I think they can be a lot more effective than, than we, we might have originally thought. I think another, just real quickly, another great example of that is the online organization called Avaz, A-V-A-A-Z. I mean, their list is like literally millions of millions of people and they may have shitty petitions about things that a lot of us might not care about but if they need to generate millions of, of emails to someone they can do it quite easily and so they do that almost entirely through online petitions i think this whole point of petitions gives somebody at home the notion that they're actually doing something which people right. have sort of spoken to at all but they're not actually really doing anything that has real impact is a problem and it's a bit like i'm old enough to have been to the stop the iraq war stop the war when tony blair was around and i think it can't remember if it was one million or three million people turned up in the streets of london and you know the uk still went to war so i think these sort of acts are maybe kind of reassuring and we think we're doing something we're definitely doing something the question is are we doing something effective in this system that we're living in Hmm. What, what I'd say, there, were, there was a modified petition that we did in Liverpool um, in, the, in the 1980s, we call it a, the Fur Pledge, and this was when there was a lot of fur departments inside depart, department stores, so they, you know, they had a, a thing, and then we, so we used to have this thing called the Fur Pledge, where people would say that they were going to boycott the entire store because there was one particular feature within it, and that seemed to work quite well, but it wasn't really a petition. Go, going to what Jake said about petition deliveries get good media, I'm not quite sure if I've seen anything like that recently. I mean, I know it used to be the case, you know, people like Spike Milligan and Joanna Lumley would turn up with a, with a petition outside Downing Street, you know, and, and that, and they'd be, they'd be in a cage or something. But um, I'm not quite sure if it's... But I mean, I do, I do get Jake's point that you can just use them as a tool to gather information and even money. So, because it does attract people. It is true that if you're on the street and people see people sign a petition, it will attract people. Then you've got Declan's point, which is, yeah, but then they'll just go away thinking that they've, you know, they've solved the problem. They've, you know, they've got the t-shirt, they can forget it kind of thing. I just wanted to put in another plug for um, the route of animal sanctuaries as being a really um, not only strategic and effective way to advocate, but also to fill up your own <laughs> cup. Um, and it's different now, right? We can't necessarily go to these sanctuaries because of what's happening in the world. But with the sanctuary I'm a part of, we've started doing a lot more virtual events too, which have um, been really successful. And folks who wouldn't have necessarily come out to the sanctuary to visit have been able to meet these individuals on Facebook live chats. And once you meet an individual and you realize, oh, there's a pig named Tulip who loves belly rubs, it's more difficult to kind of stay um, with the mode of thinking that you've been with. 
Um, and in the state of Indiana right now, there are something like 92 million pigs being raised for slaughter. And we all know that most people have never met a pig. So it's just a really powerful tool and it's positive, it's fun. Um, it's a good way to get people out and really get people thinking about things and you can kind of trick them into learning. That's what we do anyway. Um, but yeah, and, and supporting sanctuaries is really important too because a lot of these initiatives I think that we're going to talk about open rescue and maybe some other things we get animals out of places and then they need somewhere to go with people who know how to care for them so sanctuaries are awesome. Three people have talked about uh, organized talks at schools and local groups now that's an interest of mine. Yeah, and I've had some experience that that is going to be a specific thing we talk about later as far as organized talks, because I think that's a really interesting thing to contrast going to the street and hoping we come across open minded people compared with actually having pre organized talks. I think there's a, a lot of growth we can do around that. Yeah, I was just going to say um, in, in terms of uh, organized talks, I've, I've done quite a few of them. Um, I guess I was quite lucky. I uh, started doing it when I was at university. So I just had like a very, you know, I had a student population at my door and like rooms that I could easily book. So I used those to practice. Um, and then since then, um, I have found that it's a lot easier to organize um, talks at universities, like uh, with, with schools, um, especially with younger kids, like you have a lot of like safeguarding and stuff like that. Um, so there are more like barriers to entry, but um, universities are a really good one because often you can get a venue for free. Um, they often put on free food as well. Um, and uh, yeah, you often get a lot of people turning up because uh, students like to ask questions and debate and stuff. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, we, we do. As Jeremy said, we do, we do have this topic coming up in a bit more detail uh, when we get uh, through to about number six uh, poll. So if people are, are um, experienced at school talks in particular, maybe you can think, think about that whilst, you know, until that poll comes up, because I'd be really interested in some feedback on that one. What is the main reason you think animal advocates burn out? If we've got a limited amount of time, it's not about us, is it? Is it about us? Is it about something what I want to do? Well, I completely understand that everybody wants to do the things they want to do and, you know, every little helps, as it were. I think that is kind of part of the problem, that attitude. Because sometimes we have to do, do we have to do what is necessary rather than what it is that we want to do? To me, it's, it's a delicate balance because I think if we do things that don't speak to us, it's going to be difficult to keep that sustainable. I mean, to Roger's point, if we only have 10 years or so, then we should, we'd probably all do everything radically different. I think with that said, though, if we, if we push ourselves into things that, you know, are going to affect our sustainability and then we burn out, that's something to be aware of, too. But I do think, yeah, that's, so these are the points, you know, is there sometimes a higher imperative than how I feel about it and my self-care? And God knows I, I understand about burnout. I mean, I've, you know, been there, done that. It's a delicate balance, isn't it? We want to stretch our comfort zone. But we also don't want to, you know, if we were doing live tours of slaughterhouses every day, I can't imagine that being very sustainable, for instance. Tom Reagan often talks about the revolving door. So I think if, if, if we're not mindful of that and people are coming in and out of the movement, um, it's going to be really difficult to build that momentum that we really need to get things going. Because Reagan did say with revolving door, we get one in and we'll get one out. <clears throat> well, what's going on? My own, my own solution or at least my own kind of theory about that is the fact that we don't have as much focus on the ethics of the situation as we need on the grounds that we know that ethical vegans, so-called, um, are the ones who stay vegan. You know, shouldn't we be up in 15, 20, 20 percent uh, now? And, and we're not, you know. And so is the revolving door still the crucial issue? Because we're rec we seem to be recruiting OK. We don't seem to be retaining OK. That seems to me to be a major movement issue, personally. You know, I was, I was thinking, that sh should we maybe sell our houses or any property we have and, and push any monies or something like that into the, the animal rights movement? Well, the elephant, the elephant in the room, though, um, is capitalism here. That's the elephant in the room that you know, we haven't really talked about, but, that, but that's the issue. So whether you own property or whether you rent property, you're in the capitalist system. And of course, there is, you know, total liberation ideas um, ideas from David Nybert 
which are saying that, you know, we cannot get what we want within a capitalist system because the capitalist system is based on exploitation. And the idea that we can get a vegan capitalism is a real debating point. You know, uh, you know, the idea that we can win by consuming is, is, is an issue that we need to tackle as well as everything else. Regarding burnout and self-care, um, okay, we, there's a lot of talk about getting activists in, new activists. We need to retain activists. And activists leave this movement um, quite frequently because of all sorts of issues. Activists also kill themselves. Um, we've had quite a few suicides in this last 12 months. And whilst, of course, we live in a, an era where, where, where this is an absolute war on all the rest of creation and on ourselves, um, the fact of the matter is, we also have needs. We have needs for food, water, shelter, basic, you know, love, basic stuff. Um, and self-care is about whether you're, you know, sorting out your, you know, maybe having a shower or something, um, look, looking after yourself a a, a, you, in order to function. Um, and the Second World War was over in six years. Yeah. This has been going on for decades, centuries even. And I think it's, I think it's a balance. I get what Pamela is saying. I think it's a balance. But, but the fact of the matter is a lot of people have to go to work in order to eat. They have to do low paid jobs. There's a lot of activists doing that and doing ac activism on top. And um, I just think that we want to be very mindful of not pushing people too far, encouraging, yeah, but not pushing people too far, because a lot of us are in a privileged position. I am. I've been able to do activism full time. Not everybody is in that position. I try it. I try hard. I try hard. But uh, yeah, how to deal and how can, because I think that I'm not the only one. A lot of people have friends, not vegans, have family, not vegans, have uh, all around lovely people we like, we love in general, are not our compassion, have not our activism, have not our feelings or understandings. Um, regarding struggle, yeah, I totally agree. But a lot of us, I mean, I, mean, I don't know where this, uh, it, it, of course it isn't about um, what vegan food is around and whatever, but that's not what a lot of us have been doing. Um, people have been to prison, people have been killed, people have been seriously hurt, people have worked for decades, you know, um, at the, at, on the front line here. I think this is, I think there's two movements, obviously, and one is the animal liberation movement where people are in the streets, in the fields, working their socks off and yes, yeah, struggling. And there's another side, which is um, much more, as she describes it, I, I don't recognize that as um, activism really, you know, uh, going on about, um, you know, what's the best Ben and Jerry's vegan ice cream or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I don't recognize that as what, um, I've witnessed and been part of for the last uh, two and a half decades. Um, and I just think that um, one, of, one of the things about a struggle and about um, retaining activists is solidarity. And there isn't that much of it, to be honest. I think that there's a lot of people very traumatized, a lot of people suffering from PTSD. Um, and it's about how to uh, care for one another and to show that solidarity with one another um, to make sure, you know, if there's an activist who is made homeless, for example, that they're taken in somewhere, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, and we need to, we do need to work on mutual support, I think. Yeah, and I think building off the results from the last poll, the um, second runner-up um, was internal movement issues, which I think most of us will agree we've had enough of. Um, but the leading one is that they don't see enough change happening. And I think that's really what today is all about. Obviously, as individuals, we want to see change happen. But as a movement, we need to see change happen. Is street outreach efficient and effective?
for me, effectiveness and efficiency are two quite different things. Um, so for street outreach specifically, is street outreach, let's say, a cube? Is it effective? Yes, you can go to a busy place in central London, set up a cube, and you're going to you're going to get a lot of attraction, a lot of interest, and a lot of in opportunities to speak to members of the public about the issue. Is it efficient? Well, if you compare that with doing a school talk or a university talk, where it takes one hour to deliver a presentation to a hundred people who are ideally listening and engaged in what you're saying, there's no comparison. That is far more efficient than three or four hours of, of street outreach. And that's why I'm actually, um, I know I've spoken earlier about um, doing school talks. That is the form of advocacy I'm, I'm moving towards myself. When we're talking about education, we actually need to be as activists educating ourselves by looking at other movements and how they have actually achieved any sort of change, what they've succeeded in doing, what they haven't succeeded in doing. Just come back to what Brad said about, you know, talking in colleges and schools and you might talk to a hundred people. You know, it's great, but that's great too. Brilliant. But, but you know, on the, on the street, we sat for Roger on the street there in Dublin, we done a rough count one day and 15,000 people passed by where we are on the street. It's probably one of the busiest streets in Dublin where we are. You know, and there's always people taking videos and photographs and coming over to chat to us. So, so just more of a, if let's just say you've got, a, let's just say 20 activists and every single activist or you've got five different approaches all at once. And, and I'm not saying one is better than the other, but if you've got a group of welfareists, a group of animal rights, and then you've got plant-based advocates, and for example, a lot of people use the term voiceless to describe animals, and it's not in a political point of view, they just describe them as voiceless, can it not do more harm than good? Many of those could, I suppose, do more harm than good. Um, there's, there's no one size fits all because, you know, We've analysed that we're at war here, but nobody's come up with a way of, of winning it. And this is the problem. I mean, Tom Reagan used the metaphor of, of war uh, himself. It's just that we, you know, we might, uh, we might even talk about ways of, of winning, you know, individual battles within the war. But to, to actually get to where we want to go is, is, a, is a big issue. And we are probably asking for the biggest revolution that's ever been known in terms of, of human relations with the planet uh, with each other and obviously with the other, other animals. But in relation to outreach, yeah, I mean, obviously communication skills is very important, you know, and um, I, I personally don't like the, the notion that other animals are voiceless uh, myself, but um, you, you obviously understand uh, the meaning of, of that, that they, as it were, can't, uh, you know, take part in dialogue uh, you know, human dialogue, they can't exactly be on question time on TV themselves. So they, they need, um, they need human beings to, to do that. But, you know, in, in, in terms of uh, their status and their moral status, it's not a cool thing to say. I'm not quite sure about whether the idea is to have a mix of different activists so they can talk to different people. And, and then it's a question of, you know, how do you, how do you marry the one up with, 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 with the other? my own my own position is to tell the truth about what we want which from my point of view is that we want um animal rights we want people to understand that other animals are rights bearers and we want them to accept the idea that when we use them that's a rights violation that's the strongest message in our toolbox i think and that's what i would like to see more of what should we focus on when writing a press release Roger, you wouldn't have had any experience with that, would you have? I would. <laughs> um, <laughs> Go for it. A press release is an, an upside down story. So you've got to start with the, with the crescendo. So you, you've got to, I mean, they, they typically say, you know, you've got to have who, what, when, and why right at the beginning in, in, in the first kind of sentence, really, or the first couple of sentences. The, the more peripheral stuff about the details can, can come later, but you've got to kind of grab their attention because you're in a in a very kind of tight marketplace, to use that phrase, and you've got, you've got to grab the attention of the sub-editor or the journalist, uh, etc. in the same way as that's exactly how a newspaper article is written. 
you know, the, the headline is very grabbing, the first paragraph, and then it gets more and more detailed. And most people don't get past the first couple of paragraphs. And, you know, it's interesting because from our point of view, some of the most interesting stuff from a campaigner's point of view is right at the end where you get the, the, the to and throw, throw between, say, ourselves and the counter movement and what a politician might say. Most people might not even get there, you know. But in terms of um, writing a press release, yeah, you, you kind of, you've got to have a, a good heading. You've, you've got to give them the details straight away, very clear, um, you know, very uh, effective, you know. I mean, my own position on that as well is that um, often, um, often journalists get veganism and animal rights wrong, but that's our fault. I think that's our movement's fault because we often present what is called veganism and what is called animal rights incorrectly as well so we we can't blame we can't blame journalists if they keep asking us cruelty questions you know uh, oh do you do you, are you are you really about humane meat or what, what whatever it is we can't blame them that because if, if if they're asking those questions it means they're not getting us and then they're, they're not getting what we're about you know whereas if if you if we have a relationship with with, with journalists and they understand where we're coming from they t tend then to ask uh relevant questions rather than you know, trying and, trying to and take it into into the welfare area if if we're presenting as as a right thing. That, that's just a, a side issue. But yeah, uh, a, a press release upside down story. All the main details first. You know, and as 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 kind of um, intention grabbing as possible. You know, my background is journalism, and you know what Roger said is absolutely right. Particularly the bit about um, building relationships with journalists. You know. And basically doing as much work as you can for them so ideally what they want is to sort of like have a and the press release should be really short never you know more than about three or four paragraphs but you know really building the relationship which is difficult is key and also this is why I'm, all, I'm always banging on about reframing the conversation the words we use you know because that's the sort of thing that you would be uh, would be really important in um, reframing the conversation is part of the whole press release writing which is basically what Roger was alluding to. So words, so again, this whole thing of the voiceless thing. Most of my activism has, you know, I've only been vegan for, I don't know, six or seven years. And before that, I was doing a lot of campaigning on human rights and sort of like environmental stuff, particularly in majority world countries. And when people talk about this voiceless thing, it's, a very, it's this whole sort of like basically saviour, this basically white saviour thing going on. And it's not just about the, the, the vegan movement, not movement. It, it, there was a, a little charity um, working with people in India and it was called Reach the Unreached, which sounds, you know, you sort of get what's going on there. You think, yeah, they're right out in the villages. You know, they probably don't have electricity or anything like that. And that's all of it. But um, they're not unreached to themselves, are they? Who is like the whole, do, do people get sort of get this? That they're, you know, if you're living in a little village in the middle of India, you're not unreached, you're in your little community in the middle of India. And then some bunch of saviors come in there, oh, they're unreached, good hearted saviors. It's exactly like this whole voiceless thing. You know, it's we're, then we're positioning, positioning ourselves in the superior position because we know better whoever that we is. And I think this is a sort of self-examination that we should be doing, not to, you know, not to hair shirts, but to sort of like understand the hierarchies of power and our privileges. Thank you for watching this episode of Common Ground. As I mentioned at the beginning, this was quite a long recording session, and we set a new record, so it's being divided into three parts. So if you want to see those other parts, be sure to hit that subscribe button and follow us on social media. We also want to have the most diverse representation of the animal advocate community as possible, so please share our Facebook events, and you may want to consider using that Facebook invite friends feature so we can be sure this is getting to as many animal advocates as possible. Thanks for watching, be sure to share your thoughts in the comments, and we'll see you in the next one.